Hi everyone, I'm Sandy Lucas, the Program Manager for the Climate Variability and Predictability Program at NOAA. Thank you for joining us for the fourth session of the webinar series called Tropical Pacific Observing System Process Studies. This is a continuation of a series of webinars for the CVP program that started several years ago. Today's webinars are being recorded and will be available from the CPO website under the Climate Variability and Predictability section. If you've missed any of the prior CVP webinar series or the previous talks, I encourage you to view them from our website. Today's session will be posted there soon. CVP supports research that enhances our process level understanding of the climate system through observation, modeling, analysis, and field study. The topic of this series is the tropical Pacific Ocean and its focus is to build upon and refine current scientific understanding of the tropical Pacific climate system. The tropical Pacific region is important to climate variability due to its role in El Nino Southern Oscillation and so, and the teleconnections to the United States weather and climate. This webinar series covers the eight projects funded by CVP, which started in September of 2018. The focus of these modeling studies is to refine the current scientific understanding with a specific focus on two process studies identified in the TPOS 2020 first report. The, fir the first is the Pacific Upwelling and Mixing Physics, or PUMP, and the second is the air-sea interaction at the eastern edge of the warm pool. How it comes to these projects will be used to further the development of a possible field campaign or campaigns in the tropical Pacific region. I look forward to hearing the results of these projects in this webinar series. I'd like to thank Jose, Jose Algreen, the CVP program specialist and the organizer of this series for all of the hard work that he has done putting it together. At this point, I'll turn it over to Jose for the full introduction of this series and our speakers today. Thanks. And Jose? Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose Algarin, the Program Specialist for the Climate Variability and Predictability Program here at NOAA. Welcome to the fourth of five webinar sessions on the topic of the Tropical Pacific Observing System, or TPOS, process studies. Each of the sessions features two presentations and will run until November 10th, 2022. That's next week. This series of presentations will share the latest results from these projects and will allow the researchers to discuss the importance of their work outcomes and lessons learned with a broader scientific community. We hope you will enjoy today's talks and ask questions. Speaking of questions, if you have one for a presenter, please use the raise your hand feature, which you can find on the control panel for the GoToWebinar. At the end of the presentation, I will unmute those who have raised their hands so that they can ask the questions using their audio. You will also need to unmute yourself after I do so here. If you have audio problems, I will ask you to type your question into the questions box, which can also be found on your control panel. Now, for our first presenter is Dr. Shui Shen. Dr. Shen is a professor of atmospheric sciences and associate dean for research in the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. Her research focuses on high impact weather and climate extremes, air sea interaction in hurricanes, coastal flooding, and the MJO and its global impacts using airborne and satellite observations and coupled atmosphere wave ocean models. She's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, AMS, and a recipient of the AMS Spurdrop Gold Medal in 2022. Dr. Shen, thank you so much for joining us. At this time, we'll turn the controls over to you. Thank you, Jose, for that great introduction. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this particular report on a project we've been working on the last few years uh, is really dealing with two very familiar phenomena. One is MGO, the other is ENSO, but over the uh, tropical Pacific. So the goal is looking at some modeling studies, some observations, to see the connection between the MGO and ENSO through mode-scale air-sea coupling process, specifically rain, salinity, wind, and ocean currents. So this work has mostly done by a, a research scientist, uh, uh, Brandon Kearns, 
and also PhD students Yaklin. Um, the picture shows here, and we also like to thank Megan Cronin and uh, Dong Xiao Zhang as a co-PI on this project. So the objectives is to better understand MGO and the ocean atmosphere interactions affecting the SST front and uh, how this contribute to warm pool ex eastward extension during the onsite and ENSO. We also like to assess the observational needs uh, that would help model development and improve prediction possibly for the future um, of uh, El Nino onsite, for instance. The way I will uh, focus my talk, first I will uh, uh, discuss the uh, methodology that tracking the MGO because that's a very unique part of the study. So, uh, so we can actually do the feature-based uh, tracking rather than uh, some index. As you will see, that will be become a very important for this kind of study. Second part, I will look at the uh, multi-scale air-sea ocean coupling process. How does the thing moves warm pool? Um, eastward. So then we will discuss some implications of how this upscaling influence of MGO could uh, influence uh, ENSO over the uh, larger basin. But at uh, same time, we don't know for a uh, fact that a we're not discussing the cause effect, but mostly dealing with uh, the two phenomena coincide in the Pacific and looking at the process itself. So the two phenomena. MGO is on the intraseasonal time scale to the left, uh, 30 to 90 days. It has a lot of rain and surface winds and uh, ocean impacts over from in the ocean to the uh, Central Pacific. On the other hand, ENSO is every two to seven years and uh, the Signature is from the uh, La Nino conditions to normal to the uh, El Nino con conditions. So the connection we're uh, looking at is how this air sea interaction connected the two. So I'm just using a schematic uh, done by someone in Boulder and National Weather Service on their website. I think this is a really nice demonstration of all these process occurring. The key part is that if you look at the, uh, the MGO has large uh, scale precipitation and dump a lot of rain and fresh water and also generate uh, ocean cabin wave and helping propagating uh, eastward of certain features. But a very specific part I want you to focus on is this piece where there's very clear warm water uh, especially uh, post MGO phase, I will uh, talk about a little bit um, that how this east war propagation occurs and how do they actually accumulating from um, sometimes one to two to three events um, prior to the onset of ENSO. So first, like I said, I will repeat this a little bit. Some of you already seeing this. It's important to actually tracking the large soil precipitation as we want to actually know MGO is precipitating event and we want to know the rainfall and fresh water input to the ocean. So we're first tracking the large soil precipitation pattern as object uh, over many days. And then we define the MGO as continued eastward propagation for at least the seven days that filter, uh, 10 days, the filter also synoptic this methodology was published in the JDR paper 2020. And this pretty much summarized how we do this tracking precipitation in the top uh, panel is the actual precipitation seriality. Then we filter them over five, uh, three days. Then the time uh, envelope, which is the lower panel. So that's follow the shapes and the, uh, the uh, time and how it works. But the most important thing is this actually gave you not only the um, uh, zonal propagation, also tell you the meridional uh, process, you know, where the rain is, happened to be really critical for uh, 
the study we're trying to get. So uh, back to this motivation that we've been looking at the um, ENSO, which first take a look at the, uh, the right side of these multi-panels and over last more than 20 years, that the way we plotted this is in time from top downward. And the first one is that you will see the MGO events as detracted by the one I just described. And we also have SST, which is magenta curve, uh, over the same time that you can see the, uh, the SST pushing forward um, with a seasonal cycle and sometimes it's much beyond seasonal cycle. And this is the uh, sort of warm pool anomaly and then that lead you to um, the uh, ENSO index. So basically we're looking at some of the events right before ENSO onset, which happened to be that most of these onset has enhanced that MGO event. Um, so we'll be looking at an uh, example of one model simulation of eight months to capture these multi-MGO influence on the uh, uh, warming of the uh, Central Pacific to, uh, to the East Pacific eventually. So to the left, this shows you the rain rate is observed in this particular case, surface winds, and also SST that is observed as well. And the uh, showing the La Nino transition to El Nino phase uh, during this event is 2018. Um, prior to the onsite, we have three events. So let me see if I can forward this. So if we composite all the 20 years in this paper, Yaclin have done a great job uh, looking at MGO impact on the SST. So if you're looking at SST, uh, the MGO induced the warming, which is the top panel, that is during the MGO tend to be over the uh, West Pacific. But post MGO is after MGO precipitation, the wind is done over the next several weeks. In fact, you get very strong warming uh, in the Central Pacific. Then if you do the difference field, you'll find the anomalous SST warming is actually projecting onto the uh, Nino 3 and 4. Keep that in mind. So basically, if you're looking at this event, this time we're plotting the SST uh, representation of a warm pool. Each contour is rep representing time. So again, similar idea try to follow the uh, 28.5 degree Celsius. And the top event is during the onset of uh, 2002, that you can clearly see the equal, oops, sorry, equatorial uh, worm pool migrate eastward during this uh, a month when you have MGO event. And similarly, 2018, you have quite a bit of eastward propagating uh, worm pool follow the color and especially East Pacific, uh, the uh, uh, Equatorial Pacific, even though uh, the other off equator, you also have that signature as well. So the way we are doing this is that we will uh, track both precipitation. These are the top is the large scale uh, precipitation that we've been tracking. And the lower one, uh, we added surface wind because the surface wind and the, the uh, uh, precipitation from MGO are coherent, and they both produce the effect that later on become uh, obvious to you later is how they contribute to the uh, warm pool eastward propagating uh, phenomena here. So the MGO induced upper ocean dynamics and the thermodynamics response has been observed and studied using models. Uh, first is that MGO, uh, this is described in the Kessler et al, 1995, that MGO does uh, the uh, western wind burst do induce the equatorial Kevin wave that actually uh, increase mixing and uh, deepening the, uh, the mix layer and have the uh, eastward propagating feature to that. The other part, which is very relevant to our study, 
is that MGO do have another uh, component that's a little more like thermodynamic event uh, effect. You have a precipitation, then you increase uh, the uh, fresh water decreasing the salinity. And uh, during the post MGO part, that you tend to form a barrier layer. And this particular uh, diagram is from the Anderson all 1996 based on Togokura observations. And uh, this barrier layer can actually enhancing the uh, help to uh, to absorb the solar um, radiation on the top ocean, top part. So the question is how this sort of a post MGO event in the near the surface of fresh pool that can propagate uh, eastward after MGO is done, which as we observed. So then we decide to under this project, we're using a couple of model that including the uh, uh, is a development in my group at the University of Washington that including the uh, atmosphere components of the model is the wharf um, and the ocean circulation model in HICOM. We also have a wave components in the coupler. So this particular case, we use ECMWF uh, reanalysis as the lateral boundary forcing and also the uh, initial conditions, and also the HICOM global analysis. This work has been published uh, last year in the ocean modeling. So that's the uh, domain that we are conducting our uh, simulation. And uh, the SST is showing the color in from HICOM and also precipitation from WARF. So the key part of the results, uh, given the limit time, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. As you can see, the warm pool, which is uh, the, this is plotted the te ocean temperature from the surface to about 200 meter deep. And during the multiple MGO events, two, one, two, three, like the one I showed, as you can see, the warm water and warm pool extended eastward and also deeper uh, into the mix, uh, the, uh, the uh, closer to the thermal cline. And the fresh pool, this uh, is the blue part, also extending, not as fast as the uh, the momentum part, but certainly you can see the, the eastward propagating warm pool. So to summarize this is that we did two model experiment. One that we including precipitation, evaporation, and the salinity uh, coupling in the model then we contrast that to a uh, simulation that without precipitation and evaporation. So basically we withhold that forcing term, not putting into ocean. So the big difference of the two is actually very striking. So if you look at the difference of insalinity, which is the uh, vertical, this is in time, you can see the, obviously the one that we didn't include in fresh water we don't have a salinity from, but this minus uh, the one without, so it tells you the effect of the precipitation and salinity, which has a clear freshwater pool. And what's interesting now is this ocean currents. This is a plot in the middle panel. So you can see the ocean currents during the early stage of MGO, you actually have the uh, westerly winds as you propagate through toward the Central Pacific, in fact, the winds, I didn't plot here, but it's actually uh, easterlies, which is the treatment regime. So basically telling me that the ocean currents with the fresh pool is propagating against trade winds. So that has to be coming from ocean dynamic process that pushing the ocean currents against uh, winds. So again, uh, the last one is the uh, temperature uh, difference. So you can see the warm uh, frontal, uh, the warm pool front uh, propagating along with all the other features. So turned out this particular event was also being observed at the mooring um, over 20, uh, 165 east. So the top panel is the winds and then the MGO precipitation. Uh, this over that same period of time uh, we were looking at the model results, we cut the last event 
um, that Morin captured over near the Central Pacific. So MGO again westerlies against mostly perpetual easterlies, which is the trade winds. So you will see the burst of uh, westerlies and the rainfall. So um, at end of this last event one two three you will see this fresh pool um, over this particular location. And very interestingly, you also see the currents. That was really important, the thing that you see the easterly current is underneath the, the trade winds, which means wind stress going the other direction. So our study is trying to follow up this modeling study here that Yaclin's uh, PhD thesis is focused on um, actually understand this particular part is the uh, how this uh, ocean currents with the fresh pool propagating eastward. So I'm going to skip this particular one. This one just shows you a different location of barrier for formation and stuff. It's a confirmation of what we just discussed. But focus on one particular aspect of the study is that we decided to look at the budget of a momentum. So that tells that this particular uh, region during this period of time, this is the uh, time we have La Nino transition to neutral. To, and so, so you will see this area that SST tend to have burst of warming, but then at the end, you see the magenta curve is actually moving toward that uh, east. So this event here right before is definitely the one that we are focus on to look at how this propagating features work. And again, zonal wind stress that is sort of a giving you this uh, easterly winds when you actually have the warming against the eastward. And then this is a cabin wave. So basically, when we compute this, we realize this particular thing is really related to um, a term in the budget equation, which is a pressure gradient. As early study have indicated, the fresh water jet could actually move the water, um, overcome the wind stress over the surface. Um, so I think I just stated that. I'll just kind of uh, show you the term that we computed the, uh, the uh, pressure gradient in the upper ocean that you can clearly see that is the uh, positive term right near the front of this particular event when you actually have the eastward propagation. So um, I'm going to summarize uh, this quickly uh, with a schematic for what we've been seeing. So during the first phase is during the MGO uh, phase. We have a very strong influence from MGO rain and winds in the short time scale to say uh, anywhere a uh, few weeks. So that's over the West Pacific. You have uh, fresh water and then you have barrier layer and all that players. So then after the MGO, you tend to have this warm pool propagate eastward, both deepening of the thermocline, also barrier layer gets deeper in this upper part of the ocean. And at the same time, this warm pool keep propagating um, eastward against trade winds uh, during this phase, which we just demonstrated the pressure gradient seemed to contribute quite a bit to that particular process itself. So now we're actually uh, 10 to 40 days past MGO. So it's definitely within the MGO, we have a uh, rain and events that actually much higher resolution few days or uh, mesoscale system is actually, raining system is actually uh, each of these things only uh, last for a few hours. So it truly is take multiple physical process on multiple time scales to get where we are in the middle panel. So we're still looking at long-term analysis to looking at the further uh, next phase of, of this um, interaction that is 
post MGO, when you have the warm pool push further toward east from the Central Pacific, you tend to have the relaxation of trade winds. And then that's the signature on the little longer time scale when you ha start having this onset of uh, El Nino. So basically, it's very much a multi-scale uh, phenomena itself. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, claim that MGO uh, is actually only process. There's a lot of other process, especially the uh, uh, insole has its own basic dynamics. But the triggering of these onset to, uh, from the El Nino to La Nino could have something to do with these multi-MGO event pusher in this region. So to summarize, recapture what I said, um, in this study, we show that large-scale precipitation tracking really is robust direct measurements of MGO in its convection and precipitation, which really uh, needed for understand the uh, fresh water input to the ocean. And it also gave you both zonal and uh, meridional structures that we can use for diagnose models. And uh, MGO convection precipitation and surface winds are key to its impacts through the multiple scope process for sure. But during the modeling, using the modeling study, we find that precipitation, evaporation, and salinity coupling play an important role to move the uh, warm pool uh, eastward. So that is uh, something that we are really interested in looking into uh, further. So there's uh, these results have been summarized in a number of publications, either outvision and something to be sooner to be um, submitted. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. And I can probably entertain any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for that excellent presentation. As she said right now, we're going to open up the floor for questions, if anybody has one. All right, see that Dan Witt has a question. I'm going to unmute you and please unmute yourself. Hi, Shu Yi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. That was a great talk. I appreciate it. I was, I was wanted to ask about the um, pressure gradient force and momentum dynamics going against the uh, wind stress. So I guess I think of, I guess I wasn't clear if you were trying to say that the buoyancy anomalies associated with the rain uh, were driving the pressure gradient force. And if that's the case, like I would expect that to have to integrate down from the surface, right? As opposed to SSH anomalies. And so I was trying to, I was wondering if you could sort of explain like where, how that pressure gradient force arises. Is it really the buoyancy anomaly that, and then thus you have to integrate down to get that, that pressure anomaly over depth, right? Comparing to different longitudes or whether, what role the SSH plays in that and how you think that works, if you could clarify that. Yeah, excellent question. In fact, uh, I uh, didn't mention how we compute the momentum budget. So yes, it is actually uh, in the upper ocean, not only surface. So that momentum um, part of a forcing from pressure gradient is from this deep warm, uh, warm pool, uh, especially the fresh water and the generated uh, the, uh, the density uh, differential that's getting the pressure gradient. So the way we computed the momentum, uh, we did uh, from surface to uh, 50 meter. Then we did another one from uh, from surface to, to um, uh, 100 meter. So those are kind of a, indicating the same thing. So basically, that's how the pressure gradient uh, is a dominant term. Even though you have wind forcing and mixing and some other terms are large, but the net part is the the part shines through is the pressure gradient force uh, over the upper ocean going along with the uh, the density front. Yeah, SSH, you definitely can observe that. So in fact, Yaklin has more uh, in the observations. We're looking at both the ocean reanalysis for multi events. So that we can't really observe ocean um, vertical structure very well, but um, the uh, SS, 
H definitely has that signal. Does that answer your question? I hope. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I fully understand the dynamics of it myself, but I can't expect that from from just this from just this. So that was really great. Yeah, thank you. All right. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Shan at the moment? I see one. Go ahead, Frank, Brian. I show you. Um, Hi. Could you, uh, you said uh, quickly how you decided on the, the scale of the large scale filter um, for tracking the precipitation anomaly. It's sort of two parts is how that meridional scale is determined. And then, it, and some of the figures you showed, there was very clear uh, eastward propagation of the fresh slash warm pool well off the equator. Mm -hmm. and whether you feel that that off equatorial eastward propagation is really just coherent with the with the dynamics in the equatorial waveguide, or is there something else going on out on those two lobes that we saw moving eastward? Yes, again, excellent question, and I don't think I know the answer to the second one, but let me address the first one. The way we filter uh, the precipitation is we uh, use five degree uh, distance. So that way we know we're filtered out of uh, atmosphere mesoscale system. So it become a larger scale. And then we do that five degree, uh, do a filter smoother. And that's just space, spatial. So that the, including, you know, both meridional and uh, zonal variabilities. So really mm -hmm. is a feature we're tracking. Um, so that when we did that, uh, then you you find that even though you have a lot of precipitation, very heavy precipitation from a mesoscale, but overall they're coherent. So this is what MGO input is that it's a large scale group of convection right. um, to actually driving that. So uh, in terms of warm pool, that's actually been puzzling to us too. Is the 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 eastward propagating off the equator because that is actually have a whole lot of fresh water there too because it's ITCZ. Um, so in the way that in general when MGO rains and when it's merging just from the West Pacific to Central Pacific, you will find some of the rain get into the ITCZ region as well, right? So fresh water and the same uh, variables applied there. But what driving that uh, for uh, eastward propagation, I don't know if they are the same as the equatorial dynamics. So uh, certainly deserve okay. a little more looking into. Okay, look forward to that, thanks. All right, with that, we're gonna thank once, once more to Dr. Chui Shan for her excellent presentation. And now we're gonna move on to our second presenter of the day. She is Dr. Carol Ann Clayson. Uh, Dr. Clayson is the Associate Director for Research Strategies and a Senior Scientist in the Department of Physical Oceanography at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Her current areas of research include understanding the air-sea boundary layers and impacts on weather, climate, and energy sectors, and the development of satellite and in-situ sensors to observe these processes. She has served on numerous national and international science panels and also authored or co-authored over 65 journals, journal articles and two books on air-sea boundary layers and numerical ocean modeling. Dr. Clayson, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna turn the controls over to you right now. Thank you. All right, I think you can see my um, my main screen here. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, my my colleagues on this uh, work were uh, Jim Edson here at Woods Hole Oceanographic and Eric Skillingstad at Oregon State University, who I believe is on the on saw on the call. So I'm going to take a little bit of a closer look in um, at some of the processes uh, directly relating between the ocean and atmospheric boundary layers. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of different processes occurring across this uh, permeable barrier between the between the two fluids, and I'm not going to talk about all of these today. 
um, this does highlight a few of the things that we'll be mentioning um, throughout today, including cold pools and near surface shear and mixing downwards. So our objective of this project was to look at um, kind of at a close in scale how freshwater flux and darnel variability uh, impact upper ocean mixing processes and then how those in turn impact back on atmospheric convection and precipitation. And also part of our part of our goal of this project was to then provide some recommendations for observations as we're looking forward to future process studies and, and work that needs to be done in this area. So I will just touch briefly on three separate um, but related topics, flux parameterizations and improvements, um, ocean vertical resolution and impact, and then a cold pool and marine boundary layer evaporation impacts on convection. So um, I will just move from one to the other. So just to mention that bulk flux parameterizations in the tropics, bulk flux parameterizations are designed to produce, you know, as accurate as possible and, and, and in most cases, quite accurate um, fluxes under average, um, kind of average conditions. But we have very limited observations under certain conditions that really impact the uncertainties. Um, and I started to write a couple and then I just kind of kept writing. So there's actually, when I started thinking about it, there's a number of, of ways um, in which this is an issue. Wind wave current misalignment, swell, high winds, heavy rain um, is an issue, strongly stable conditions under areas where there is significant surface heterogeneity, um, SST gradients near coasts, the marginal ice zones, and with varying wave fields. So uh, as it, you know, I guess average, conditions is not necessarily always occurring by any means um, in the global ocean. So we wanted to look at, you know, what do we have and is it possible to do um, a little bit better uh, at getting some of these observations? Um, and so the focus has been lately on direct flux measurements from buoys uh, that remove some of the issues that we have with flow distortion and measurement height on the ship measurements. And the key thing is when we get these direct covariance um, measurements, these are direct flux measurements, and then they can be used to improve bulk formulas. Um, it should also be mentioned as a side benefit that these motion corrected winds dramatically improve wind speed estimates on the buoys. Um, and then of course we can use these fluxes for process studies, but there are real issues associated with power consumption and motion correction and telemetry needed in near real time. Um, and of course, we need a robust system if we're going to have operational use. So here's, um, I show uh, versions of this slide to talk about where we have um, where we have observations from. And I'll include, um, there's a number of sites here and including now the TPOS uh, site um, that I'll mention in just a moment. But operationally, meaning sort of long-term, there's really actually only a couple of these sites. Spurs one and two were both year-long roughly experiments. The Southern Ocean down here um, was out for one year and then NSF uh, cut the Southern Ocean buoy system. So, and not all of the ones left here in OOI have flux packages on them. Um, and so, you know, the real desire is to get, is to get them on more positions. To just demonstrate the dearth of observations that we have, we did direct measurements of latent heat flux during SPURS 2, so that was you know, roughly a year of buoy measurements, and that doubled, doubled the number of direct flux measurements of latent heat flux over the oceans that we have um, in hand. So that may be an example of that. So the direct measurements of turbulent fluxes, we won't walk through all of this, but it the key is that it requires the measurement of 3D velocity, temperature, and platform, as well as motion at high frequencies, roughly 20 hertz. So there's you know, a number of different instruments that go on there. And then we can use those measurements to parameterize or estimate the transfer coefficients from the bulk values. So there were two related projects, um, which were to look at using a low power um, direct covariance flux system on that we've been using for research buoys, replacement on buoys for operational use. And that was, you know, NDBC TAL buoys, um, Tom Farrar, Megan Cronin, and Chris Farrell were on that, and NDBC TPOS and um, velocity test moorings. And that one, in, again, and with uh, Billy Kessler as well added to that. So the, the flexes were computed and in real time and telemetered back to shore. 
So um, we can see on the right there are just the heat budget terms that were collected. This is the TPOS enhanced mooring and the real-time delivery of some of these observations. And then analyses of those drag coefficients, or again, what the transfer coefficients that we need to relate mean, um, as mean measurements of wind to actual stress. Um, we just wanted to note here that algorithms like the core algorithm typically rely on accurate measurement or simulation of the SST or skin temperature and correction for surface currents and that's because when they're as as they're taking the observe as they're taking the observations um the, that when you do that it's actually taking into account the surface relative so uh even if um the atmospheric models use these parameterizations they're commonly initialized and updated using bulk sea surface temperature uh and often they're at not uh, they don't have information on the currents and so the fluxes are rarely rarely computed relative to water so that's already a couple of issues associated with um, uh, the flux measurements and work in the in the models and just as a demonstration this is the impact of using a subskin temperature on fluxes this was actually during dynamo um, if we look there so there's a suppressed phase and an active phase of mjo and uh, you, so at the top you can see the temperatures. The red is um, the red is uh, the sea snake corrected to the surface, and the other is the ship at about three meters. And at the bottom is kind of an interesting comparison. So C new here is the uh, newest version of core, and now this the difference between this version of core and core 3.0 for the latent heat flux. If you then look at it and say, then what's the difference between if we use all the new coefficients and we use just the skin surface temperature or the ship temperature, that difference is in the magenta. Um, and so you can see that getting getting the inputs right is at least as important as getting those flux parameterizations right. Um, when we look at the various types of algorithms and parameterizations that are used in different in different model simulations, um, it can kind of vary between what we see from the data, which is in binned here with the, the bins and the uh, standard deviations shown. And now what we see are three separate uh, types of transfer coefficients or flux parameterizations, the core, um, the uh, large and Jaeger and ECMWF. Um, and you can see, especially if we look at the lower panel, which is under stable conditions, the strong differences between the, um, the parameterizations and, uh, and in some cases, how different they are from, from the data itself. So Jim actually went through and said, what if we took the, the Large and Jaeger form, formalization and just recomputed um, the uh, coefficients and in the format of Large and Jaeger. And so he has done that um, and does get then a much closer synchronicity between the data and um, and the parameterization. So just thought we'd mention that as something that we can give that. The other thing that I think is that we uh, have, have mentioned here is the diurnal warming um, impacts. And we should notice that um, in the spurs cruise which is what we really have this information for especially for latent heat flux uh, we really didn't get many cases of strong diurnal warming there are very few that were greater than about a degree and a half um, however we should point out that again not only is there an issue with using the wrong sea surface temperature as, as an input to the parameterizations but the parameterizations themselves were based on skin temperature, so including the effects of diurnal variability on that. Um, so if we said instead, well, what if we did the transfer coefficient and we use, say, the ship sea surface temperature, the three meter temperature, that would change our transfer coefficients by between five to 20 percent, depending on which part of the wind speed spectrum that we're at, which then, of course, leads directly to a difference in the fluxes of five to 20 percent. So there, you're sort of getting a double whammy if you're not if you um, are not being careful about what you're using as an input. So I've mentioned diurnal warming here. We can just talk about under light winds. Um, you get sort of this, this is uh, temperature over time. You just get this warming day to day. 
um, and you get this mixed layer. This is sort of the afternoon temperature profile on the bottom left. Under very light winds, um, obviously it warms much more. And then you get a very stable layer very near the surface. And this is worth pointing out because if you are running a, an ocean model and we're gonna see the results of that at say five meters or at one meters or at less than one meter, you get a very different sea surface temperature under conditions of very light winds. The other impact, of course, on the upper ocean is salinity. And I've mentioned the SPURS 2 experiment. Um, we had a number of assets out there in addition to the buoy itself. Um, some very nice, we're in the ITCZ, so some wonderful um, precipitation events and good wind events and also light wind conditions and a lot of diurnal variability. Um, in this case, this is just a this is a just a about a week time period. Um, again, the upper panel is temperature over with depth. Warmest waters are in the red, so you can see some diurnal variability there. At the bottom panel now is salinity, so the freshest water is in blue, and you can see on this particular day, in fact, an ex, you know a very large rain event. And then again, some real constraining of that fresh water, at least initially near the very near the surface, and then slowly being mixed throughout. Um, so what we've done here is this is now with a high resolution one-dimensional uh, one ocean model. So we just did a simulation for 30, 30 days using observed initial temperature and salinity profiles and the observed fluxes. And so we did not do, uh, the fluxes remained the same between all the model simulations. Uh, and we only changed the resolution of the, of the ocean model. So the high resolution here is essentially a 10 centimeter uh, resolution, um, a one meter resolution and a five meter resolution. And so the sea surface temperature that you see by the end of those simulations um, differs a bit between the, uh, the high resolution and the one meter and the five meter. And some of that is, as you look down towards the bottom, there's the, we're plotting the picnicline um, in time. And what can see, when can see with that high resolution, again, we're trapping that change in temperature and salinity with to the you know when you've got a five meter level a layer um, it's all being mixed throughout that entire layer but when you've got it at much higher resolution it's staying you know much closer to the surface and so you can see that the picnic line under the high resolution cases is often much shallower um, than if you're computing it with a five meter Okay, so we're just going to ask then a couple of questions regarding that, the impacts of that. So in this case, how does that darnel warm layer and freshwater lens affect atmospheric convection? So this is work we're doing with Eric Skillingstad, who's on this on this grant as well. So I just want to call him out here. I think he's on this talk as well. Um, running the triple nested wharf with an inner resolution of four kilometers. Um, ROMS is being run only over the inner wharf grid and using high calm boundary conditions for ROMS. So just going to do just a couple of examples here. So on the left and the right, the, the only differences between these simulations are the resolution of the ocean model. On the left, that's what we're calling the high resolution ocean, which is a one meter vertical. So not the high resolution of the one dimensional ocean model. Um, so this is a one meter vertical resolution and on the right is a low resolution ocean. Um, and one can see you know, immediately the larger impact of diurnal warming in the one meter vertical versus the five meter vertical resolution models. I like to think that is the, the breathing of the ocean. And again, just to point out, you know, that there, there are still differences between a one meter and a higher, even higher resolution model in this region. On the left is now, and on the right, they're both sea surface salinity from the same model simulation. So on the left, again, is the one meter resolution and on the right is the five meter resolution. And of course, one can see much better on the higher, on the higher resolution model, the, um, the freshwater lenses that pop up um, under conditions of precipitation. So as I said, the first, you know, one of the things that we really were looking at is what is the impact, we can see the impact of this on the upper ocean, is there any impact that we see on the convection? So uh, one example of that is shown here, where we've taken a slice across latitude. Um, 
And we've done a 10 day accumulated rainfall amount. In the blue are the results using the one meter resolution ocean model. And in the red are the results using the five meter resolution ocean model. Um, and one can see a demonstrable difference in sort of the locations of peak precipitation um, between these two simulations um, where, the, where the changes have been with a, with a higher resolution, um, there's a, there's a much, there, the peaks have become closer together um, by over a, a degree of latitude. Lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, ongoing work and, and Eric Skillingstead again has, has really been leading this and uh, Simon Dezoka has been on this as well, but the, the relationship between cold pools, sea surface temperature and ITCZ. And so this is now on the left is the same model that we were just looking at here, but here we're looking at air temperature uh, near the surface. And you can see now those cold pools um, sparking up through the same um, simulation that we were looking at uh, other results from earlier. But we're gonna turn now to an, another set of model simulations. In this case, a cloud resolving large eddy simulation model coupled to a mixed layer ocean model um, from the, uh, the KPP and then um, coupled with fluxes from core. And, and this has been configured with a zonal channel configuration um, with an initial SST band at 12 degrees north look at then the impacts of ITCZ uh, variability uh, as a function of those sea surface temperature gradients, which I'm not going to talk about here. I am going to talk about just briefly though is the impacts of moist processes, including the effects, the impacts of rain evaporation on convection. So now we're looking at what are the impacts of resolving some of these features within the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, not worrying now here about the <laughs> sea surface temperature but now the air surface temperature so one of the results of this work is that um, that evaporation in the atmospheric boundary layer turns out to be key to forming the cold pools so when we remove the cooling effect so on the left we have a model simulation in which we allow cold pools um, by having the uh, by including the cooling effect of rain evaporation in the atmospheric boundary layer and on the right are the uh, model simulations where you remove that cooling effect of rain um, evaporation in the atmospheric boundary layer. And this is at the, same, at the same point in time of the model simulations. And what happens is when you remove the cold pools um, from, from the simulation, then you accelerate basically the formation of strong convergence and the breakdown of our simulated ITCZ into barotropic eddies. Um, and so it, it does have a a, a significant impact on um, the ability, first of all, to form cold pools, and then again, back again into the organization of convection. So here we're looking at a 24 hour average of terms for the moisture budget um, on the right. So um, dashed as a surface latent heat flux, the, the solid lines are the uh, transport, um, meridional transport of um, um, moisture, and then the um, dotted lines are the rain evaporation um, latent heat flux in, input into the, into the moisture budget. Um, and so one can see when one looks at them, please note that these are different scales, uh, that when one has cold pools versus when one does not. So the cold pool um, simulation is on the top right. And when we do not have cold pools, we do not allow for cold pools, that simulation is on the bottom right. And certainly one can see from this that there is um, a much greater self-organization of convection when we have less disruption of the wind um, by having cold pools within the simulations itself. The last point I want to make here is that when we have, um, the, how does SST uh, interact back with um, the formation of cold pools and the ITCZ? So again, these two simulations on the left, we have cold, the cold pools on the right, no cold pools. This is now the change in sea surface temperature um, as a function of time. Uh, that, that striping that you see, you can see the diurnal variability um, every single day going on in this one. If we look at the left on the cold pools, this is a case where we have a strong SST band of about four degrees, um, that's a high SST. Um, the convergence is decreased by the cold pools. As we talked about, the ITC has a breakdown. Um, there's more intense surface heat loss. As a result of that, 
And so the SST actually um, reduces uh, over the time period of that simulation. When we do not have cold pools, we actually have stronger convergence, still ITZZ breakdown, but a less intense surface winds and heat loss. So the SST does decrease, but the end result is a warmer scenario than when we include cold pools. So we see impacts back on location and magnitude of, of precipitation and on um, resulting sea surface temperatures. So our recommendations, and that's what I wanna end with here, for progress um, here, again, I'm just, I'm focusing on observations that, uh, that seem to be needed as a result of some of these work, these simulations that we've done and the work that we've um, been looking at with the observations. We do recommend that direct measured flux systems should be placed on more operational buoys and concurrent with wave and current um, data, as that's kind of a key component of it. Um, we do like to say that modelers should not select the flux parameterization that produces the results they want. So in other words, sort of removing the bulk flux parameterization is a tunable factor. Uh, it's also important that we do um, much more effort towards getting the measurements of vertical profiles in both the atmospheric and oceanic boundary layer. And for that, we would say both the state variables and in the atmospheric boundary layer, getting the fluxes within the atmospheric boundary layer itself. And we also need to be looking at, you notice all of our simulations here, we're looking at a, you know, a fairly small area and looking very much at what are those, you know, sub-mesoscale, mesoscale types of variability in addition to the very high vertical resolution. So we think that in order to really understand these air-sea interactions at various scales, we need measurements that um, follow along with that. And some examples are, you know, the observations of the vertical structure and evolution of cold pools at a very high temporal resolution and the observations of sea surface temperature fronts, their processes in combination with direct measurements of surface fluxes and uh, information about the atmospheric planetary boundary layer. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Clayson, for that excellent presentation. We have a few minutes for questions. So go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you have any for Dr. Clayson. All right, I see that Dan Witt has one. Let me unmute you. Go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and end my show so okay. I can see. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, yeah, I just is sort of mostly a curiosity question. I guess I was struck uh, by the, and maybe I've seen this before, the difference between the, simu the sort of, I think there were 1D simulations with the uh, 10 centimeter, one meter, five meter resolution. And I was wondering how you're actually in those simulations, you're defining vertical mixing, particularly because I think the top few meters should be sort of a complex wave driven mixing that is, well, I don't know how to parameterize. So I'm not sure that anyone does. So I'm curious what you reckon. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And I will point out, you know, notice that we ran that for 30 days. Obviously, a one-dimensional mixed layer model is not going to be accurate after 30 days because you know we're ignoring some other important processes in the region. It was really just to see what's what's the impact of the of the resolution on the eventual outcome. Um, with this particular model, we are using um, essentially as a, a, to a second moment closure turbulence model with some parameterizations in for wave breaking, wave mixing, and Langmuir circulations. And we are also um, including some variability associated with uh, how much background mixing we're including. So in some of these, it, in these types of models, there's an estimate of background mixing, which has to do with uh, sometimes the, the fact that we are parameterizing the impacts of internal waves. Um, and here, so in order to do, when we get very, very strong diurnal warming, we actually have to tamp that down so that it, it gives a better representation. Uh, during spurs, we never really had that high of diurnal warming, so that was not a factor. But you, you know, you're absolutely correct. The other thing I didn't mention on this is that there are other things that can impact back on how much diurnal warming one has, such as um, what are the absorption characteristics of the ocean, which is very rarely measured at the same time as any of these other parameters. So we, we are definitely making some estimates. 
Thank you. All right, we're close to four o'clock. If anybody has any other questions, it's your time now. Going once, going twice. All right, we would like to thank for joining us for this set of presentations in our series on the Tropical Pacific Observing System Process Studies. I would like to thank today's presenters, both Dr. Chan and Dr. Clayson for taking the time to share their work and results with us. The recording of today's webinar will be available within the next week on our website, cpo.noaa.gov slash cvp. Uh, we will hope you will join us for the next webinar next Thursday, Thursday, November 10th. We'll have again two presenters, uh, Deepak Sherian from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR. His presentation is Off Equatorial Deep Cycle Turbulence Forced by Tropical Instability Waves. And Dan Witt from NASA, his presentation is Simulating Turbulent Vertical Heat Transport from Mesoscales to Turbulent Scales in the Equatorial Pacific Ocean Cold Tone. Uh, again, that's next Thursday, November 10th. Thank you so much. Sandy, any last words? I just want to say thank you to our speakers, Carol Ann and Shui. Uh, great presentations, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Take Thanks. care.